Hello, I'm Joe Chamberlain, the Executive Director of the Coast Side Land Trust. We welcome you today to one in our series of webinars. Uh, I want to start by thanking you for your continued support. Without your financial support, the Coast Side Land Trust would not be able to continue our um, preserving of land and also our programming such as the webinar and the Junior Land Stewards program. A copy of this webinar will be emailed to you later today or tomorrow. It will also be posted on our website so you can view it or share it with, uh, with others who are interested. Um, the, as we Gary wraps up his presentation, Kate, our social media manager, will come on to facilitate the Q&A. Your questions can be placed in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type those in. And um, then uh, if we have questions left over, uh, we'll see how we'll handle those, but Kate will help you with that. So we are just so delighted today to have the uh, Gary Griggs with us. He's a distinguished professor at UC Santa Cruz. His specialty is in geology. And he has, uh, he's probably famous to many of you for the several books that he's written on the geology of California. And he is an amazing expert and a fabulous presenter. And we are delighted to have him with us today. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy his presentation. Gary, are you ready to start your talk? I think so. If you can see that screen, we're good. Yes. <laughs> okay. I am ready. Um, thank you, Joe. And um, this title might be a little misleading because it's, it's a brief history of a very long period of time. Um, and four and a half billion years is the age of the Earth, which we don't have along the coast, but we have a lot of younger material that says a lot about what this area has gone through over time. Um, and one of the things that's important, um, I think, is to put some perspective on sort of how things evolve. And it turns out, it's been said that the history of the Earth, like the life of a soldier, consists of long periods of boredom separated by short intervals of terror. And we have whether it's earthquakes or volcanoes or tsunamis, we have these periodic events. Um, and then long periods of time when not too much happens. So this was up in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, during the Loma Prieta earthquake. And if we go back, this is the old part, uh, four and a half billion years ago, <laughs> things started out hot, molten, and inhospitable. But generally, things got better over time as the Earth began to cool. Uh, water began to condense, water vapor, oceans began to form. Uh, and then with the oceans, sort of the geologic record got better. Uh, more was recorded. And if we look at the geologic map of California, and this is a little bit oversimplified, but it's incredibly complicated. If you went to Nebraska or Kansas and you looked at the different geologic materials, there might be three or four. California has hundreds of distinct formations. And one of the things that makes it complicated is the San Andreas Fault, which runs through central California. Um, so we are sitting right on a boundary between two tectonic plates. Um, so we are more or less <coughs> here, but the colors give you a sense of the kind of rocks. Um, and we'll come back to this, but essentially the the red are the granites of the Sierras. <clears throat> you can see, for example, that those granites get pulled down into the San Andreas Fault. And those granites also exist in San Diego, but then they've been pulled north along the fault to places like the Farallons, um, Montara Mountain, uh, Point Lobos, and so forth. So they said it's been folded and faulted and subducted and erupted and rotated and stretched and sliced into pieces. So going to any one place is fairly complicated to try to figure out its history. <clears throat> and the sort of underlying story that we've uh, developed over the last, particularly the last 50 or so years, <clears throat> is one of the sort of mobility of the earth and the fact that we now understand it consists of <clears throat> 
five or six or seven large tectonic plates that are about 60 miles thick and they move around relative to one another. And it's what happens at the edge of those plates, which is exciting. And this series of dots are actually a short history of earthquake epicenters. And when we put a earthquake on uh, a two-dimensional map, um, generally, most earthquakes occur at some depth, not right at the surface. Um, they may be shallow. In this case, they are from the surface down to say 70 kilometers or 40 miles in depth where they actually occurred. And then we have some that are from 70 to 300 and then over 300 kilometers. <clears throat> and you can see one good example of this increasing depth is along the coast of South America. We'll get into this, but we actually have a place where uh, this plate is going down beneath South America in a trench or a subduction zone. And the fact that these earthquakes get deeper as we go further landward is because that plate is going down at an angle. So when this map was first put together in the late 60s, this was sort of a, a major discovery that in fact, these earthquakes outline the major plates. And you may notice that a lot of those earthquakes, I don't a lot, a number of those run right through California. Um, so we can go from the earthquakes to these distinct plates. And what surprised a lot of people initially was the edges of these plates aren't necessarily the edges of the continents. And these plates are formed by uh, different kinds of processes. In the case of the ocean, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge or the East Pacific Rise or the Mid-Indian Ridge, these are places where Volcanic, volcanic activity from within the mantle is coming to the surface and spreading plates apart where new ocean crust is being created. So we call that a spreading center. And those occur th through the oceans, this continuous line, about 40,000 miles long. It sort of looks like the seams on a baseball. And then we have places where the plates are colliding. And that happens mostly around the Pacific where the very large Pacific plate uh, collides with Alaska, uh, Japan, the Philippines, New Zealand, and so forth. And then we have places where plates slide alongside of one another. And we have a couple of good examples. Um, one is actually in New Zealand. <coughs> one is the San Andreas Fault. There's actually one in Turkey. So plates can have different kinds of motion. Um, so there's us. Um, and this is just sort of a diagram of those processes all put together on one map. So this is what's happening out in the middle of the Atlantic, was happening along our own coastline 30 million years ago, uh, hot material coming to the surface, spreading out laterally. And in the case of, say, um, the area from Cape Mendocino to Vancouver Island, um, <coughs> there is a trench or a subduction zone where this plate goes down. And as it descends, it gets caught on this overlying plate, which um, builds up stress until <coughs> maybe after three or four or 500 years, it breaks and we create a very large earthquake. And usually as this overlying plate rebounds, we create a tsunami. The other thing that happens mostly around the Pacific is when that hot, uh, when this plate goes down into the mantle, um, it gets hot, it starts to melt, fluids come to the surface <coughs> and create volcanoes. So in the West Coast, we have the Cascades, Mount Lassen, Mount Shasta, Mount Hood, Mount Baker, Mount St. Helens, and so forth. If we're in the Aleutians, we have the volcanoes of the Aleutian chain, Japan, New Zealand, and so forth. So this is a very complete picture. This is a diagrammatic one. Um, this is sort of, uh, I don't know, I love this. This is a animation going from 180 million years ago to the present over about nine seconds. We're kind of speeding things up here. And what it is showing is how the continents started out together and how they've moved apart 
from these ocean ridges. So watch carefully because this goes pretty quick. Uh, one of the fascinating one of the fascinating things is watching <coughs> South America pull away from Africa, North America pull away from Europe, <coughs> and then India, Antarctica, Australia were all joined over the South Pole. There's a much longer story here we don't have time to tell, but watch what happens when India moves across the Indian Ocean 100 million years ago, and then it collides with Asia 50 million years ago, as does Australia, and this pushes up the Himalayas, the Tibetan Plateau. So um, interesting to try to figure out why things look like they do. Um, another quick animation, this is now getting closer to California um, rather than the globe. So we know from a lot of research that um, if we go back, we're gonna go from 40 million years ago to uh, about, well, close to the present. And we had an ocean ridge off California. It still exists off Northern California, Oregon, Washington, where a new ocean crust is being created. But about 20 million years ago, the North American plate collided with it. And you'll see this ocean ridge sort of being subducted in the trench. So while we did have a trench, we did have a spreading center off of Central California <clears throat> that transitioned to the San Andreas Fault. Do you can kind of see this ridge spreading going down into this trench, that plate? And then here around 20, 25 million years ago, this collision takes place. And you can see Baja California moves away from Mexico, opens up the Gulf of California, the San Andreas Fault forms, and we kind of slide the western part of California that we're on, the whole coastside area north. And, um, whoops, this is now gonna go um, from the present about 10 million years into the future. Now, we won't all be here, but we can see what happens if this motion, <clears throat> here it's still spreading, it's opening up the Gulf of California, pulling Baja away from Mexico. That continues and actually starts to split off closer to the Sierra and you'll see California start to slide north. Um, and it rips open out here, giving us a bigger Gulf of California. So at some point in the future, uh, California and Baja will become the Madagascar of the Pacific, sliding towards um, the Aleutian Trench. If we looked at, and this could be San Mateo or Santa Cruz County coast, if we looked at the coast, um, roughly 75 million years ago. And we just took a slice through the landscape. We would see this Farallon plate was being subducted or carried down into this trench as it started to melt. It was producing a hot magma that was coming to the surface. So this was the old Sierra Nevada. It's what's still happening in the Cascades, but no longer because this boundary change to the San Andreas. And we can see the coast ranges, the Central Valley, um, sort of a reconstruction of what Central California would have looked like 75 million years ago. Um, today, if we look at it, so that line could have been drawn across here. Today, if we looked at it, um, we can see the plate boundary as the San Andreas Fault is this gash here that starts up at um, Bolinas. Um, I'm sorry, Tamales Bay goes down through excuse me, um, sort of near Pacifica, down through Crystal Springs, San Andreas Lake, down through the Santa Cruz Mountains, and then on down um, towards Hollister and San Juan Batista. So there's the main fault, the plate boundary today. But in fact, um, it's slightly more complicated. Um, we have the Hayward Calaveras Fault that goes up through the East Bay, um, and we have the San Gregorio Fault that goes through um, Anya Nuevo, Half Moon Bay, um, and then extends down through Monterey Bay and down into San Luis Obispo County. But 
what has happened here is the San Andreas Fault <coughs> has a bend in it. With a little imagination, you can see if, um, if this was straight, it would go down here, <coughs> or if this was straight, it would head up here. But in order to make, because this plate is running into this bend, and this plate is running into this bend, it's sort of created these branch faults that make Central California very complicated. Um, and one of the things that that produces in that tectonic activity is earthquakes. So they're a part of the landscape um, that we will have forever. Um, Loma Prieta back in 1989 was 6.9 magnitude. A lot of um, homes were destroyed for a lot of different reasons, but <clears throat> one of those was building codes weren't like they are today. Houses weren't um, attached firmly to their foundations. In this case and many others, there was a double car garage door opening with no shear. So when you start shaking the upper part of the structure, it's just sort of um, turned over like a row of dominoes. This is Moss Landing Marine Laboratories built on a sand spit that liquefied. Um, and it was a complete loss. Um, that had happened before in 1906, and there's a long story why they rebuilt it in the same place. Um, places you probably saw in 1989, this is um, downtown Santa Cruz, which was, um, there was a few buildings survived, but ultimately most of those were demolished and we have a whole new downtown. And Santa Cruz downtown is built on the floodplain of the San Lorenzo River, uh, much like the shaking that occurred in Oakland um, and San Francisco down along the waterfront. The softer, the more water is in the materials, the more violently they're going to shake. So Santa Cruz, Watsonville, San Jose were all built seismically in poor locations. Um, so if we look at the coast, and we're talking about this particular stretch, it's about 1,100 miles long. And these are sort of the main physiographic features of, of um, California. So we've got the coast ranges, the Klamath Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, the Central Valley, so forth. Um, but it's pretty complicated. Uh, in fact, it's very complicated from that earlier map. So if we looked at the coast, um, you may all recognize this area. Um, Devil slide before we put the bypass through about 13% of the coast consists of what we would say, you know, steep high relief coastal mountains. Um, part of <coughs> San Mateo County, part of Marin County, most of Big Sur. And what's sort of fascinating here, you may notice, there's a um, some kind of interesting structure across here that you may all be very familiar with. Um, and back in the early days of the last century, they developed the Ocean Shore Railway to connect um, San Francisco, open up the San Mateo coast to development. And it was planned to go all the way to Santa Cruz. Think, how did they ever build it across this, you know, unstable cliff? But they used um, mostly Chinese laborers. And the next picture is taken right down here. Um, can see what they had to do to get that track in there and the old Ocean Shore Railway instead of heading down towards Montara. Um, it didn't do very well. The, the 06 earthquake occurred just after it was built. There was sort of an economic decline, so it was never completed. Um, finally, the highway was built, but pretty amazing what they did at that point. <clears throat> so 17% is, you know, did I say 17%? 13% steep, rugged coastal mountains. The great bulk of the California coast, almost 60% looks like um, this. So this is um, <clears throat> the coast just north of Santa Cruz. It's a mixture of um, Brussels sprouts. Part of the year they grow pumpkins. Um, so we call these marine terraces, uplifted marine terraces. And these are a response to both relatively erodible sedimentary rocks, in this case, it's mudstone, and gradual uplift, uplift of the coastline, which has been happening for many years. 
and then a rise and a fall in sea level. So this terrace, which we know is about 100,000 years old when it was cut, used to be at sea level. And it was raised <coughs> over time. Um, this is up on the San Mateo County coast, the same feature. And what they did was put Highway 1 along the back edge of it so they could maximize the productivity. And if you look at the California coast, whether it's Santa Cruz or San Mateo or Mendocino or Fort Bragg or Crescent City or San Diego, this uplifted marine terrace, this flat surface is what made both agriculture possible and development possible. So most of the city of Santa Cruz, most of Half Moon Bay is all built on this nice flat marine terrace, which made construction easy. If you start down the Big Sur coast, and I've read that it's supposed to be open by the end of April, um, there aren't very many flat areas. There's a few near Point Sur and a few other places, but general, in general, nobody lives there. Um, there's no flat area to build on. So it's this rugged scenic highway. Um, the remaining 28% of the coast are what I'm calling coastal lowlands with estuaries, dunes, and beaches. This is inner Monterey Bay, the mouth of the Pajaro River. Um, so we have places like inner Monterey Bay and Santa Monica Bay where <laughs> we don't have mountains, we don't have terraces, but it's where streams have come out um, sediment is accumulated to form dunes and beaches. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit about the geologic materials under our coast. When one of my daughters was in, I don't know what grade, third grade, fourth grade, they were trying to teach them a little bit about rocks. And instead of saying igneous rocks, they called them fire rocks. <laughs> instead of saying sedimentary rocks, they called them water rocks. And instead of metamorphic rocks, they called them changing rocks. And the kids remembered those. But basically, these are the three general types of rocks. And we see these along the central coast. So igneous things that started as a magma or a lava, we have both those that are intrusive, that cool within the earth. So crystals form, we get things like granite and a whole series of other similar rocks that um, have coarse crystals. We can identify those minerals. If those um, lavas get to the surface, they get extruded onto the landscape. And that's happening in Iceland today, probably happening in Hawaii today. They cool much more quickly. The extreme would be um, obsidian. It's actually sort of volcanic glass. But we have rocks that you really have a hard time identifying minerals in because it it cools so quickly, the minerals don't have a chance to form. And we do have <coughs> cobbles of these kind of rocks in places like um, uh, Pigeon Point, uh, down at Point Lobos and so forth. Um, sedimentary rocks, again, mostly form in water. So things you're familiar with, usually named by the size of the materials or the grain. So we have sandstone, the coarsest, um, finer grain to siltstone. Then we have shale or mudstone, a lot of these along the coast. And there's also those that form chemically <clears throat> that actually precipitate out, or they could be formed from organisms like coral reefs, limestone, calcium carbonate. Um, and then we have metamorphic rocks that have been altered with increased pressure and temperature. And we have um, actually, I'm not sure we have any slate around here, but in Santa Cruz Mountains and under the UC campus, we have schist and gneiss and marble, um, which have been converted from, say, in Marble's case, it started out life as a limestone and was subjected to temperature and pressure, recrystallized. So if we took a cross section through the Santa Cruz Mountains, this could be Santa Cruz or Davenport or <coughs> further north. Um, generally, at the core, we have granite. And it turns out this is Sierra granite that's been moved north along the San Andreas Fault. Within that granite are some pods of older rock that are now metamorphic. They've been converted by temperature and pressure increases to schist, which might have started life as a sandstone and marble. And then stacked on top of there, but that have been uplifted, 
are a number of sedimentary rocks, these water rocks, things you may recognize up in San Mateo County. Uh, Santa Cruz Mudstone is actually another unit on top of here, the Parisma Formation, Santa Margarita Sandstone, Monterey Shale, so forth. So that's a typical cross section. The oldest rocks that we know of are the ones that are contained within this granite. Um, and they are probably on the order of 100 million years old, but we're not completely sure. We cannot date those and there's no fossil preserved. If we looked sort of at the bottom of that stack of rocks, and <clears throat> most of these are exposed in the Santa Cruz Mountains, we can see a whole bunch of different named geologic formations, which are distinct. And we get up to San Mateo, Santa Cruz um, coast, it's pretty much these upper younger, maybe the last 15, 20 million years. These are exposed in the Santa Cruz Mountains and higher up in the hills, but these give you some idea of, of, of what's in these different formations. And again, as I mentioned, we've got granite in the Santa Cruz Mountains. We've got it at uh, Montara. We have it at Bodega. We have it at the Farallons, Point Lobos, the Monterey Peninsula. So as this San Andreas Fault formed, and started pulling Santa, well, pulling California apart, it actually ripped off some of this granite and carried it north. So it's gone maybe 400 miles north over the last 20 million years. So when you see the granite um, out at Montara um, or Bodega or you know, Monterey Peninsula, that is Sierra and granite that's been moved north. So there's the path. And if we get, again, go back a little bit to the oldest rocks, it's this marble. And this is one of the quarries. Davenport was another one where they made cement from this. Um, and this marble, it's not the marble that Michelangelo carved, which is really fine grain and you can make, you know, beautiful statues. This is much coarser grain. The crystals grew pretty big and this is all calcium and carbonate, which most seashells and corals, and mussels and clams are made out of. In this case, it consisted of two microscopic organisms that made calcium carbonate shells. One is actually um, called a coccolith, um, a plant, and one is a planktonic foraminifera. So these are very, very, very small. But they accumulated because we had very fertile waters in these areas 100 million years ago or so. They accumulated to you know depths of hundreds of feet. <clears throat> Productivity was really high in the surface waters. This is when you know the coast was underwater, and we gradually converted those over time with increased pressure and temperature to the the marble, which we now um, have made into cement. So Davenport. Um, as most of you probably know, was a cement plant for <coughs> probably well over a century. Um, it's now closed and they actually brought the marble into the plant through a conveyor belt. Essentially, they heat it in big kilns and they take calcium carbonate. When you heat it up, you drive off carbon dioxide, CO2, and you're left with calcium oxide, which is lime, and that's sort of the building block of cement. So that's what they did here for a century. Um, interestingly, if you look out here in the water, you can actually see what was left of a pier. And way back <coughs> in the middle of the last century, I think the 30s, 40s, 50s, they actually built a pier and they would ship this dry um, to San Francisco or wherever else. This was a really challenging proposition because the, the waves and the weather is really pretty severe. Just to tie this ship up to this pier was problematic. So then for years, it went out on rail and in trucks. Um, and if you look at it today, all you see is the inner several um, support system for that, um, that pier. Um, there's been a lot of coastal change over the years. We did a book a couple of years ago called The Santa Cruz Coast, Then and Now. Then and now. We found a lot of old historical photographs and then tried to go back to the same place 
and take another one today, which in some cases was easy, in some cases was very hard because you couldn't stand there. But um, this is the original cement plat back in about 1906. Um, and at that point, they were actually using <coughs> sand from the beach, which was salt and it wasn't a very good mix to make concrete. <coughs> but what's fascinating is you drive down the coast today from <coughs> Half Moon Bay to Santa Cruz. <coughs> um, the highway and originally the railroad had to cross all these streams. This is San Vicente Creek at Davenport. And <coughs> they want the railroad to stay at the same grade. The highway um, now goes in and is on a big embankment. But what they did, which is fascinating, they built a wooden trestle. And then they took the dirt and rock from the cuts and surrounded this or covered it to support it with the material from the cliff here. <coughs> so under every one of those railroad trestles out there, there's a, um, every, every one of the crossings of the stream, there's actually an old wooden trestle, hard to believe. And we went back to the same site, stood in the same place, which I discovered happened to be surrounded with poison oak a um, hundred years later. And you can see um, this is the same uh, embankment and it's interesting to see how um, this rock really has changed a little in 100 years and not very much change out here in that subsequent 100 years. So this is the Santa Cruz mudstone, maybe three to five, six million years old. It's generally pretty hard, weak enough to cut a terrace into, but pretty hard. So again, coming up from this cross section, the old marble we just talked about, the granite, um, looks like granite. Most of it along this coast isn't that fresh like you would find in the Sierras, but it makes up the Farallons. It makes up um, Point San Pedro. So this is all Sierra and granite <clears> that's <throat> been transported north. Um, and then we can look up through a whole series of, of younger sedimentary rocks that are sort of lapped up on here. Um, Monterey Shale, the Santa Margarita Sandstone, the Santa Cruz Mudstone. Um, so Monterey Shale, we see it at Año Nuevo. Uh, we see it in the Santa Cruz Mountains. It has a lot of um, diatoms in it that produced a lot of silica. <clears throat> so we actually have um, sort of a unique kind of rock uh, made of um, diatoms called diatomite, particularly down near Lompoc. And um, this is used for filtering of swimming pools and wine and beer and water. But if we took a cross section again across the Central Valley out on the coast. Um, turns out the Monterey Formation is one of California's biggest oil producers in Southern California, sort of a, a unique formation. This is what it looks like up at Año Nuevo, a shale. Um, and as we head up the coast across the Golden Gate, you can see uh, that rock has been, actually this is a slightly different kind of rock, but it's been folded <clears throat> contorted. This is the marine headlands, kind of fascinating rocks. Um, but this is the, um, these are the original diatoms that made up some of that rock that's really high in silica. And today <clears throat> that silica has been um, sort of remobilized and uh, converted to chert, which is like obsidian, it's silica silicon dioxide, but instead of having a volcanic origin, it has a sedimentary origin. So you see a lot of this on the beaches of <clears throat> Año Nuevo, and the, these, these actually are polished, but if you took a piece of it, it's very shiny, very glassy, and if you break it, you can actually um, chip this into arrowheads, which is what the Native Americans did when they discovered this. Um, then the really, uh, one of the youngest material is Santa Margarita sandstone, quarried for construction sand. It occurs in Scotts Valley on Wilder Ranch. Um, and it has a lot of um, shark's teeth and sand dollars in it. So this was a sea that went in clear over to the Santa Clara Valley. And then probably the most common rock, at least in Santa Cruz coast is the Santa Cruz mudstone. Um, kind of a nondescript rock, um, a lot of silica, really hard. And it has some interesting features in it, these concretions that may have been formed by methane, 
being uh, extruded up at the surface. And there's also a fascinating place you may have been to. Um, it has several names, this beach. Um, most people call it Yellow Bank Beach. In fact, in the old days, there was a Yellow Bank Dairy. And on the side of this sort of point here, there's actually an outcrop that <clears throat> some people think looks like a panther. So it's been called Panther Beach. But what's unique here is this is the mudstone here, but these are sedimentary intrusions, sort of like um, volcanic intrusions, but it was soft, sandy material saturated with oil in some cases or water in some cases that got squeezed up into the overlying mudstone, several generations of this. <clears throat> and you can see this is a, I think it's called shark's tooth beach just south of Davenport. You can actually see one of these intrusions is running up through the cliff here. It tends to be weaker and softer. So the waves have eroded and created a lot of tunnels and arches and caves. Um, this is another image of that intrusion. Um, really unique. A lot of people walk down there and don't even notice what's there. The other thing I would warn you about, this is a pretty popular beach. Um, it's also an easy place uh, to have your car broken into. So um, one has to be a little careful, but it's a fascinating bit of geology. Um, and then the mudstone also has, I'm always impressed with some of the odd sort of staining and structures you get in the mudstone. Mostly this is um, iron that gets into <clears throat> these rocks probably from water seeping through. Some people think these are bacteria colonies. Um, amazing stuff. I mean, it has not so much geologic significance, but it's just fascinating to, to observe. So this is the Parisima formation that occurs. You can see this is up near Tinitas. It's um, the youngest rock on the landscape, maybe three to five million years old. So this is all bedrock. This is actually where the Ocean Shore Railroad was going to go. Um, so this is the lowest marine terrace. And then on top of the bedrock are these younger marine terrace deposits. Um, and if we look at the Parisima, this is actually in Santa Cruz and Capitola. It was clearly a marine deposit. Um, lots of these layers that are just stuffed full of shells. And the other thing, um, marine mammal fossils. This is actually at the um, Seymour Marine Discovery Center at, at the Coastal Science Campus of UC Santa Cruz. <coughs> and this was a chunk of um, <coughs> the Prisma where you can see individual whale vertebra and ribs. And if you walk the stretch of cliff between Capitola and New Brighton Beach, you can actually see these in the cliff. Um, and this is another uh, whale skeleton that was found um, near Pleasure Point. I don't know in San Mateo County if any of the individual sections of the Parisima <coughs> have a well-developed fossil, fossil record, but fascinating that this is, you know, right here in our backyard. <coughs> so again, one of, the, one of the features that is dominant along our coast, most of the California coast, certainly the Santa Cruz, San Mateo coast, are these uplifted marine terraces. So the first one that is farmed um, about 100,000 years old. And then at the back edge of that, as you drive up Highway 1, you'll see these hills. <coughs> Excuse me, this was the sea cliff. This was the counterpart of this cliff when this terrace was at sea level and being eroded by the waves. And then we can go, this, by the way, is about six miles north of Santa Cruz, midway between Santa Cruz and Davenport. You can see a second terrace. Um, this has some farming, sometimes grazing. <clears throat> there's a third terrace about 350,000 years old. In a few places, there's actually a fourth and a fifth. Um, so how do these form? Well, this is um, the modern sea cliff and the modern beach, and then this eroded platform by surf action um, when waves are breaking. But if we come up the top of that cliff, we can actually, and, and this is what that wave cut platform looks like in Capitol. This was taken during the 
2011 tsunami, one of my students who I warned not to do this walked out there to take a picture. So this is what the waves are eroding and building today, this wave cut platform. Along the shoreline, it'll be covered with beach sand, maybe some dunes, but as this gets uplifted, we can preserve that platform. If we look along this um, feature today, we'll see mollusks and things have burrowed into it and we can find those fossilized on this uplifted 100,000 year old terrace. And then over time, as this gets uplifted, we'll find <coughs> beach sands forming on it, sometimes dune sands, sometimes stream deposits. And over time, it'll actually begin to sort of be degraded as this cliff is eroded and sediments build up. So this is sort of um, the present profile. Um, so what we need is gradual, continual uplift over hundreds of thousands of years. And we also need to have sea level going up and down. So this is um, about 360,000 years of sea level rise and fall. Um, it's been what we call today zero. That's a longer story. Um, any time in the past has been someplace else, but we called it zero for convenience. Um, it's been 400 feet lower, but every time it's high, we can cut a terrace like today. When it's high here and then it drops, and this has to do with climate change and getting cooler, so ice sheets expand and form. Um, then the waves retreat, the shoreline retreats, but the but the shoreline keeps rising so we can preserve this terrace. This is sort of a, <coughs> another animation of that process happening. So you can see the waves are eating away, climate gets warm, ice melts, sea level rises, gets cold again, sea level goes down. This is now tens of thousands of years. The waves keep eating away, forming a sea cliff, forming a terrace, it gets, warm again, sea level rises, <coughs> we cut another terrace, goes back down again, but the land is still coming up. The waves come up again, sea level comes up, but now land is higher, so it can't erode these upper terraces. And then over time, development occurs. And the waves keep coming. <laughs> so this is sort of ending with where we sit today, whether it's Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, or San Mateo, <coughs> development on these nice flat terraces. Um, so if we look at those terraces today, this is Wilder Ranch. We can actually see the bedrock. And then these fossil mollusks that burrowed down in when this was in the intertidal zone. And then on top of it, the sand from dunes and the beach and so forth. Pretty characteristic. Um, this is another place along West Cliff where you can see those fossil mollusks. Um, a couple of other things just to wrap this up. Um, one of the things we deal with a lot today is coastal erosion, shoreline erosion. Sea level is an issue here we're not going to talk about, but <coughs> there's sort of two general processes we see along our central coast here. One is beach erosion. This is next to Lighthouse Point, and you can see a typical summer picture. Whoops. Typical, not say typical, an extreme winter picture. The sandy roads, the beach is gone. <clears throat> the next um, summer, the beach comes back again. This is seasonal and expected. It's just sand. It's easy to move in and out. On the other hand, cliff retreat, it only goes in one direction. This is the terrace at Capitola, and the terrace or the cliff between Capitola and New Brighton is one of the most rapidly eroding stretches on the Cal central California coast. It's going back about a foot per year, which is a problem. Um, and we've, again, gone back and looked at some older photographs to see how this is taking place. This is Wilder Ranch about 1890. Uh, and then 2006, we come back and that arch is gone. The horses are gone, the wagons are gone. Um, and then Lighthouse Point, um, so we're looking over at sort of <coughs> the boardwalk area in 1885, another one of these arches. Um, within about five years, that arch had collapsed. And then today, what we can see is 
all that's left of that arch is this little pedestal. So this is a common practice. The things that make these beautiful arches, the soft rock also make it possible to erode them. Natural bridges in 1890, there were three bridges. By 1970, one to collapse, there was two. And now there's one. So it really should be called Natural Bridge State Park because there's only one, but I don't think they're going to change it. And there's some other places. This is just above Natural Bridges in front of the Marine Lab. <clears throat> 1924, a ship called the La Feliz that was carrying canned sardines or something went on the rocks at night. Um, people came out and they shone their headlights out here and they put some block and tackle and uh, got the crew off. And in order to get the sardines off, they actually took this mast off and put it up against the cliff and use that with the block and tackle to salvage the cargo. So this is 1924, really hard mudstone out here. So this is now about almost a hundred years later. And if you look at it, you'll see these rocks have not changed much in almost a hundred years. <clears throat> and believe it or not, the mast of that ship is still there. So there are places that don't erode as quickly. I mean, Natural Bridges is just a half a mile away where we lost two arches. So there are some different places. Um, Capitola, the Antigua Apartments, Antigua Apartments sitting on the bluff edge. This is another problem not unique to Capitola. Um, you could have bought this a few years ago. <coughs> um, I don't want to leave San Mateo County out of this, but in the big 1983 El Nino, um, major erosion took place, threatening a number of these houses on, I'm trying to think of the name of this road, but it doesn't matter. You recognize this area, I'm sure. They brought in a lot of rocks trying to protect it. And by the time the 1998 El Nino hit, the rock had scattered up and down the coast. And I think almost that whole row of houses had now collapsed or been pushed off. But this is not granite. This is just weak soil. Um, an area that's probably gotten a lot more recognition recently um, are these apartments in Pacifica that were built back a ways, not that long ago, pre-coastal commission. But this is really weak sand. And you can see even runoff from the roof and patio has uh, gullied this. Um, by 2011, <clears throat> they were right on the edge and the effort's been made to put some rocks in. Um, there was an engineering effort to try to stabilize this by drilling back into the bluff, putting in tiebacks and shotcrete, which simply did not work. Um, still trying to rent these, got closer to the edge, collapse, and as you know now, those have all been demolished. So um, I guess my final message here is um, the Pacific Ocean is 8,000 miles wide, and it really doesn't care too much about few feet on either side, but historically, we built in some calm climatic periods and a lot of development was put right on the bluff edge. So I'm gonna stop there um, and we can go back to stop share and... Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> So, and thank you all for being here to listen. We've got, we've got a little bit of time. Are you still, are you, are we okay to ask a few questions? Sure, as long as they're easy. Okay. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> no, it's okay. Whatever you want to ask. <clears throat> With 250 people, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. <laughs> Some great ones. Um, you know, just because you were just talking about that sea level rise and the impacts on the coast and, um, could you speak at all to how you you think that climate change affects the geology of the coast? That's kind of a big one. Do you you mean how it affects what's happening here forward? Yes. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think the short answer is um, in the short term, probably till maybe mid-century 2050, <clears throat> it's gonna be the short-term extreme event. So the things that have affected Pacifica, for example, or Santa Cruz, haven't really been sea level rise because it's only been rising at you know, three and a half millimeters per year, not very fast. In the long run, that's gonna catch up. So it's these short-term events. It's an El Nino with elevated sea levels. It's large waves 
arriving at times of high tides where there isn't much beach. And that's what really has hurt Pacifica and Santa Cruz is waves eroding that loose sandy material. But over time, we know the greenhouse gas <coughs> um, composition of the atmosphere is increasing, temperature is increasing. Um, we don't have enough uh, electric cars out there yet to <laughs> make up for that. So the questions we're dealing with now is how high will sea level be at different places in 2030, 2050, 2100? And how do we deal with that? When that gets really messy in a hurry, um, it's not that scientists don't know what we're doing, but there's a lot of other issues that affect sea level rise besides what we think may be happening. The more fossil fuels we burn, the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the warmer it gets, the faster sea level rises, the faster ice melts. So um, I'd love to be here in 2100. I don't think I will be. <clears throat> so climate change will have a bigger effect in the future than it is right now. There's other things that are happening. It's getting drier and hotter and more fires and um, you know droughts and so forth. But in terms of the coast, sea level rise isn't the biggest issue here now. It is in Florida, a very low lying. So we keep flooding the streets of many of those East Coast cities, but we generally are a little higher than that. Thank you. Um, and someone else is asking, uh, William is asking, can you explain the formation of the Moss Beach sink line? Uh, <clears throat> so a little hard to imagine, but um, I'm trying to think here. There's some really cool images, but I, I should get into starting to put new things on the screen. So <laughs> um, rocks, rocks can do amazing things. They can be fairly um, ductile. We can actually squeeze them and bend them and fold them. So um, for example, if you start in Santa Cruz and start driving um, over Highway 17, those sedimentary rocks that are flat lying by the time you get to the crest of 17, they've been tilted clear up on edge and even overturned. So we can actually fold rocks into all kinds of shapes. So with, we're not far from the San Gregorio Fault um, in Moss Beach. In fact, it goes right through Moss Beach. <laughs> it goes right along the edge of the airport. And that's why if you look at Moss Beach, <clears throat> there's the airport and then there's that big hill out on the ocean side. So there's been uplift along there. So we're in a tectonically active area and we can take rocks that are layered like the syncline and actually squeeze them. We can actually create anaclines where the rocks are folded up and synclines where they're folded down. And y'all just made up those words because those are pretty common features. But if you just looked at it, you go, wow, that's crazy. How did that happen? Um, we can do all kinds of things with rocks. <laughs> sort of like a carpet in a way you can take a carpet and squeeze it and make you know ripples in it. A carpet's easier to imagine than hard rock, but this might've happened when that rock was a little softer. That, okay, that's interesting. Um, north of Maury Point, is that is that made of mudstone? And how old do you think? Where now? North of? North of Montera and Maury Point. <clears throat> I'm trying to think. Um, and I don't have a geologic map in front of me. Yeah, what underlies Pacifica is really weaker sedimentary rock. And the reason those points stick out, like Montara, <coughs> the Farallons, and so forth, is because it's granite. And granite is really hard. But when you see erosion taking place, it's weaker, softer sedimentary rock, like what's under those apartments in Pacifica. Um, and you do see sort of a, a hard pan along Beach Boulevard in Pacifica, when the tide goes out and the beach goes out, you can actually see some harder mudstone layers there. It's age, I'm not sure, it's not old, three to five million years old, not, not old geologically. We like to throw around those ages. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually, that's, that leads us to a good question because someone was asking, um, Marilyn was asking about a good ge a geology field trip guidebook for the area. And that you could talk to what you've been writing and also, um, just a good. <clears throat> yeah, there's actually a number of um, geological societies that have done field trips along the coast. Um, uh, 
and I can think of two or three right off that are actually online. Um, the Geological Society of America, the Peninsula Geological Society, and they'll go from Santa Cruz to San Francisco or um, something similar. So they're, they're not textbooks. Um, I did this book called um, <clears throat> Living with the Changing California Coast, um, and we go mile by mile down the coast and look at hazards and problems. But the field trips are guys are actually set. So, you know, you drive 3.2 miles, get out of your car, and you're standing here looking at X. There's also this whole series of um, roadside geologies that have written, been written for all of the Western states. So you can do Nevada and Colorado and California, Southern California, Central, Northern. So I could provide those if you wanted to, to help people who have tuned in today. Some of the links to those, they're pretty much all downloadable. Great, maybe we'll attach that. We'll, we'll check in afterwards and we'll attach that. To okay. That. Awesome, that would be great. Um, someone was asking when you did the slide in um, the Fairland plate animation, there were some red dotted lines that were along the, that were inland. What did those represent? Do you remember? <laughs> those are big cracks. <laughs> <clears throat> so you, so people may remember a couple of years ago, there was the Landers earthquake over in Eastern California. And actually North America is sort of broken up in more than one place. The San Andreas is one part of it. But in fact, um, the Sierras are sort of this asymmetrical mountain range that have been tilted up. So the California side is very gentle, and then it drops off into Owens Valley and so forth. So that's a big fault block. <laughs> and the, that part of the West is actually cracking open like a mid-ocean ridge. And you go through in Nevada, they call it the Basin and Range. It's a whole series of these fault blocks. And then you end up with a Wasatch Range over in Utah. So it's sort of slowly pulling apart. That dash line shows also in uh, Eastern California that there's some other faults. And the question is, where does that upwelling of hot material from the, mag from the mantle decide to pull California apart next? And I think that animation was showing not the San Andreas fault, but further to the east. So there are cracks we can see, there's fault, there's been earthquakes, and we just don't know. Next. People think we have all the answers, but in fact, one of the things I try to encourage young people with is we don't have all the answers. We know a lot, but there's a lot of things like when's the next earthquake going to occur? We do not know how to predict earthquakes, despite a lot of investment of time and equipment and monitoring. So that leaves us sort of, um, leaves some people sort of a little unsatisfied. Um, but on the other hand, <clears throat> even if we could predict a big earthquake is going to hit the San Francisco Bay Area, which it will in time, people talk about the big one, there will be many big ones because the plates are going to be moving forever. Um, what if we could say, okay, it's going to occur in the next six months? What would you do? Um, <laughs> You know, you could shut down nuclear power plants, which we don't have any. Maybe you could lower water levels and dams, but we need the water for agriculture. You could go out of town for six months and just shut San Francisco. So there's this sort of false security of knowing when it's going to occur, like somehow that's magic. It won't occur. It doesn't really solve the problem. Like yeah. Loma Prieta came and we didn't know it was coming. And 66 people died, so... Um, Yeah. Um, what's a favorite place along the coast to visit rock formations for you? <clears throat> One of the, I think, neatest places, and we were there a couple of weeks ago, is um, <clears throat> what I call the other Pebble Beach. So there's Pebble Beach on the Monterey Peninsula, and there's Pebble Beach on the San Mateo County coast. It's a, I think it's a county park. So just south of Pescadero, and it's a place where um, these really old rocks, 60 million years old, that also outcrop at Pigeon Point, where the lighthouse is, and they are submarine mudflow deposits, <coughs> probably deposited in a submarine canyon. And they've been tilted up on end, and the harder layers stand out and the softer layers um, 
are eroded. So you get these sort of like a sluice box where the water comes in and out and concentrates these beautiful little pebbles. I have this thing about, um, I, I don't know whether I can show you this or not. Uh, let's see. I collect. <laughs> All right, you got it. Perfect. Well, almost. Yeah, we're a little. Yep. Um, I collect sand from all over the world. I have hundreds of samples. So that's one of those places where it's, in fact, it got to be so bad because people are coming in and taking wheelbarrow loads out and they say, no pebble puppies, please don't take any pebbles. <clears throat> the other thing there is there, which I didn't show pictures of today. And there's another book. Um, I was going to show that in my last slide, but I cut it off. Um, it's called Introduction to California this is so hard to do. Introduction, I'll put it right in front of my face. No, that doesn't work either. <laughs> called Introduction to California Beaches and Coast. Okay. And it has um, a whole section in the end on patterns, things you see along the coast that are just interesting. And that's a place where there's something called Tifoni. And it's these strange little erosion solution patterns, they're all over the rocks there. They're really intricate and it's not so much understanding but just appreciating them. So that particular beach um, for me is pretty special along that coast. Point, Point Lobos is not in our sphere of influence for this, but Point Lobos is also an incredible place to see actually the same rock types and the same features, but it's, you know, 50 miles the other way. And it's extremely popular these days, whereas Pebble Beach you can get to in San Mateo County. It's, you know, it's right off the road. You can, you can, uh, you know, you're coming and you can pull off and spend the afternoon there. Um, so we had a, a right in, and, and you, you spoke to this really, but just specifically looking at, if you're at the Ritz, the, the cliffside at the Ritz Beach, there's a lighter layer on the top and the darker layer below. Could you just sort of speak again? To which, which beach now? Um, the the Ritz, right at the Ritz Carlton. Oh, right Carlton. <laughs> um, and it's probably not unlike what's behind me here on this <laughs> screen. So when I was showing those marine terrace pictures all the way up the coast where we've had an uplifted flat terrace, on the bottom we'll have bedrock. <clears throat> much harder, much older. It could be, you know, gray or brown or white or yellow. And then we have these younger, generally yellowish colored old beach sands and dune sands. So I'm guessing it's the bedrock that there might be perissima, maybe three to five million years old, and then 100,000 year old beach sand sitting on top of it. Um, but I can't say I've been out to, on the cliff at Ritz. It's not in my, not in my um, hotel <laughs> listing. <laughs> well, I think you're right. I think it is probably really similar to that in the, in the photograph too. Um, can you um, talk a little bit more about the process of intrusive igneous rock formation? Igneous rather than sedimentary. <laughs> so if we have hot molten material within the earth, <clears throat> I mean, actually this is happening. Iceland is erupting today. Iceland is right on the mid-Atlantic ridge. Hot material is coming up and it'll work its way through the underlying rocks and we can create either, um, so it's intrusive, it's intruding. If it cools within the earth, it cools slowly and we will have chance for crystals to form like granite or cyanite or diorite, which are just difference of minerals. And so that's what we see today at Montara or um, Pebble Beach, I mean, um, Point Lobos or the Farallons, it's, it's a granite like the Sierra, individual crystals that can be quite large. Um, if that intrusive material keeps going and ends up at the surface as extrusive, then it gets cooled much more quickly. So it's chilled and we have very fine grain rock like basalt and andesite and daisite. So you don't see big crystals, you might see a few little crystals. <clears throat> so it really has to do with where that rock finally cooled. So if you looked at Iceland or Hawaii, you're going to find a black rock that's pretty monotonous. It just cooled pretty quickly because it hit the air or it hit water. It didn't have a chance to form those crystals. And I mean, the extreme in this is sort of going up into the Sierra in the gold rush country. If things cool really slowly, individual minerals 
crystallize out depending on their sort of stability. So some will crystallize out at pretty high temperatures. And then as it cools slowly enough, we can actually concentrate certain minerals or elements like gold or silver or other things. Um, and the mother load was simply the place where everything worked out to concentrate gold. Because we get a little bit of gold in a lot of rocks. There's a place in Santa Cruz Mountains called Gold Gulch. They found a tiny bit of gold. But in the Sierras along Route 49, everything was perfect. You know, it cooled just slowly enough where gold came out and left these veins and deposits. So those are intrusive. You would never find gold just having extruded out in the landscape because it didn't have a chance to cool. Fascinating. Fascinating. It, is. it really is. All right. Maybe can we do like five more minutes? A couple more. Sure. sure. Right. Shale like formations at Mavericks Beach. What are those? What are the shale like formations at Mavericks Beach? Shale. <laughs> they're, they're shale. <laughs> and I don't know whether now they're talking about um, there are patterns offshore. There's a great image online I could try to get it but i don't want to mess this up of um we're close enough to the end that yeah the offshore there looks like moss beach these rocks have been um folded let's see if i can get to this <coughs> um into these incredible patterns um we're in the informal section, so no one's expecting. If we see your screen screensaver behind it, it's all it's all good. Yeah, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah. So let's see if I can now do. Um... If there, you know what, and if it if there gives you any trouble, then we'll just we'll copy the link and put it on the email. I'll just do share screen. Oh, perfect. How's that work? Great. So this is not unlike Moss Beach, which is just up a little bit, but <clears throat> these are sandstones and shales that have been folded and contorted. And this was done by the US Geological Survey. And they use, um, instead of just a simple depth finder, they use something called multi-beam where they send down a number of beams and, um, this is color coded by depth. So you can see the shallowest is reddish and then yellow, green, and blue. So these rocks have been, well, again, it's very, Moss Beach is just a little bit above here. <coughs> um, and the San Gregorio Fault goes right through here um, where there's no reflection. There's nothing there where it's soft sediment. It stays, um, it looks very plain, but where there are outcrops of rock, that reflects sound, you get each of these contortions and folds. So um, shale, mudstone that's been folded, probably a lot of it has to do with the, um, the um, San Gregorio Fault movement along the fault. Um, this person is actually just because you were talking about the San Gregorio Fault. Um, are there signs of historic earthquakes there and signs of stress there right now as well? Yes, and let's see here. We have a lot of stress out there. Um, let's see if I can find a... Um, yeah, a couple questions, someone asking again also, just to ask, just yeah. general. Um, Let's see, plate tectonics. Yeah, well, <clears throat> this is a good one. So we're gonna go back to, um, share screen. Take this out of here. Whoops. So um, I think I lost the last thing I was going to do here. Hmm? I'm just trying to keep everything together here. So um, so this is, um, there we go. Thanks, sweetheart. My wife is my consultant here on all things. So this is, um, I, I, 
I may have shown this picture, I'm not sure. <clears throat> so this is the San Andreas. This is about 30 years of earthquakes. This is the San Gregorio. And you can see even in Monterey Bay in 1926, there were two magnitude six earthquakes. And these are all on the order of magnitude two or three or four. So this is active, much less so than the San Andreas and much less so than the Calaveras Hayward Fault. Um, and one of the things we do is we can actually, I don't know of any historic earthquakes that were um, documented that created down, ground displacement. Like we can go back in 1906 and see it by point raised, fences were offset. Um, and this is probably, you know, moving at a rate of maybe, I don't know, a third or fourth as fast as the San Andreas. So, um, when it's talked about as a seismic hazard, like when they were going to build a nuclear power plant at Davenport, the um, conclusion was that this could generate a magnitude seven earthquake, which is pretty big. Loma Prieta was 6.9. So it's still a risk. You still wouldn't want to build on it, but it's not going to rupture as often as um, the San Andreas. I hope we answered that. All right, last one for today. Um, I'm sorry to everyone we didn't get to your questions. Gary has written some wonderful books and we're gonna send you some links. So hopefully this will have gotten you excited enough to, um, to get out there and do some exploring yourself and to get to learn some of these things. So that'll be your, your next steps. Um, are there any key hikes you'd recommend to see some great fossils along our coast? Fossils? The best place I know of <clears throat> is between Capitola and New Brighton Beach. It's called Depot Hill, and it's a, it's a cliff about three fourths of a mile long, but I showed those whale bones and all the shells, and um, they're right there, they're in your face. Um, a lot of those um, rocks have fallen out onto the beach, and you'll actually see something that instead of the sandstone or the siltstone, looks different it's bone you could walk right over it though because it's not a, like a big whale skeleton displayed on the bluff edge these shells are everywhere these layers of shells and one of the interesting things there is why how would you get clam shells and whales in the same rocks and what kind of environment would those have formed in and i think it's something like maybe a a monterey bay or a san francisco bay where it's it's deep enough that whales could come in and you see these layers that are shells like six inches thick, solid shells. And I think about um, a bay or an estuary where, you know, shells, mollusks live and die, that the tidal channels will concentrate the shells and the pebbles. And I think these may be tidal channels, but like we get whales coming into San Francisco Bay, I don't think the old Parisima formation was a completely enclosed bay, but maybe like something like Monterey Bay or, you know, so that's the one place I know, Depot Hill, where you can actually see fossils without any trouble at all. The, my main caution is those cliffs are failing regularly and you can't walk that if it's a high tide because the water's up against the cliff. So what you wanna do is pick a low tide and then be careful that you're not right under the edge of the cliff. Nobody's ever died there, but boy, I, every time I go down there, I see rocks falling off. And you can pick up these, you know, chunks of <coughs> shells and take them home with you. It's not a, I think if you went down there with a tractor or something, they might have some resentment, but I mean, you can <coughs> pick up these, you know, piece of rock with bone in it and seashells. And that's a, the San Mateo coast. I don't know of any places where there's any fossils exposed in the sea cliffs. And we don't have dinosaurs here, unfortunately. <laughs> and we don't have fossil horses or you know, mammoths, but we do have some marine mammals. I should say there's one other place in Scotts Valley, this Santa Margarita sand that has the shark's teeth and this, their sand dollars, they actually have a place called Sand Dollar Hill <clears throat> that you could maybe trespass a little bit and collect fossil sand dollars. And a lot of people would go up there and look for a shark's teeth that are pretty common in that sort of a shallow water environment <clears throat> where the Shark's teeth and sand dollars were preserved because they're really hard compared to other things. Right. Well, thank you. And thank you for giving us this extra time and questions. Sure. 
And thank you to so many of you who are here today and, and have stuck around for questions. I think this is the largest number of people that have stuck around for questions. So lots of interested folks here. <laughs> Um, and just, a, uh, I know Joe Chamberlain expressed at the beginning that there'll be a, an email coming out um, in the next couple of days, just sharing this, um, this recording and also some of the links that you're looking for. Um, and also just as we're thinking about, just another reminder that of course that, that um, these, this, these programs and also our important con land conservation are all um, possible because of donations. So if you haven't had a chance to donate or if some of you, maybe this is something that you regularly do just a bit each time that you attend or um, and some of, some of you, this isn't the time for that, but just to keep your, keep your eyes on, on, on how important that is um, and that we're a nonprofit. And, and we're so grateful to have these incredible speakers that are coming to share with us. Um, in, let's see, the next month uh, on May 16th, we have Jasmine Standes, who's a high school student at Half Moon Bay High School, is going to be sharing a uh, carbon sequestration project that she did, a, um, mm -hmm. a planting project that she did over at Wavecrest Open Space. So we're really just excited to hear from her. Um, so hop on our website and, and check that out and register for that. And yeah, thank you again so much, Gary Griggs. We are so grateful for having you here. And um, we'll look forward to we'll look forward to hearing we'll we'll get that email to all of you and we'll look forward to hearing or reading some of your your work that we'll be sharing some connections to. Great. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you, everybody. See you next month.